In a recent video, I told you the story of Energis, the telecoms giant that faded into obscurity that ran a fibre optic cable network across the national grid's electricity pylons. In the comments, plenty of you wanted to know more about the UK's canal-based fibre optic network. So, never want to shy away from a challenge, I've researched all I can in order to tell you the story. But, like many of the topics I lumber myself with on this channel, information wasn't forthcoming. Much of the information in this video isn't online, but I've done what I can, so here goes. Energis's use of pylons and its rapid rise to the top as a major threat to BT and Mercury is relevant in this story, as later on, the key player in the canal-based fibre optic network became a major threat to Energis. Our story begins in September 1991, when a high-tech communications link was completed at Calderdale on the Rochdale Canal, following a route pioneered more than two centuries earlier. At this time, the project was thought to be the first time a canal route was utilised for telecommunications. The company was no other than Mercury, and it completed its new cable route between Leeds and Manchester, with much of it under the towpath of the Rochdale Canal. This new fibre optic cable was capable of carrying almost a quarter of a million simultaneous telephone calls. As well as providing extra capacity, it could take over if Mercury's other cable route was disrupted for any reason. Mercury chose the canal route because it avoided the disruption to road traffic and inconvenience to pedestrians normally associated with underground works. The cable was also less likely to be disturbed by future works of other utility companies and could be laid more quickly because there were fewer restrictions on canals than on public roads. The cable route started in Manchester and ran about 30 miles under the towpath before leaving the Rochdale Canal at Sowerby Bridge for the last 20 miles along the road to Leeds. The laying of the cable was completed in three stages. First, conduit pipes were laid into the ground. Then plastic sleeves were inserted into the pipes, and lastly the fibre optic cable was fed into the sleeve. The canal was divided into stages, Callis Bridge to Stubbing Wharf, Fallingroyd Bridge to Moderna Way, and so on and so on, and two stages were closed at the same time from April 15th 1991 to allow works to take place. The cable laying went without a hitch, and there was no local opposition, except from local fishermen and perhaps some hungry ducks. It was reported that the water level in the canal had been lowered by two feet, and that a barge trying to navigate it had gotten stuck. How true this is, I don't know. The main challenge for Mercury was getting the equipment needed down the towpath, which had limited access points. Even the cobbled towpath was restored to a better standard than before, after the works were completed by September 1991. With Mercury's cable in place, British Waterways now had its eyes on a much larger scheme of their own, after a conversation that began two years earlier in 1989. Telephone Cables Limited asked British Waterways if they could lay fibre optic cables along the bed of their canals. This in itself presented challenges. There are shallow spots that would bring boats close to the cables. They wouldn't be able to dredge the canals. There would be issues whenever works needed to be conducted, and the cables wouldn't be able to pass through locks. Eventually, after much investigation, British Waterways informed Telephone Cables Limited that running cables along the canal beds wasn't a viable option. Instead, it was decided to run a trial in which cables were installed under the towpaths. The first trial route was built in Scotland in early 1994, but let's quickly revisit the ambitious submarine cable idea. First, let me clear up some company names. Southern United Telephone Cables Limited was founded in Dagenham in 1932 and later changed its name to Telephone Cables Limited in 1961. In 1967, it became part of GEC's telecommunications business, GEC Plessy Telecommunications, and was joined with Submarine Cables Limited. British Waterways publicly joined forces with GPT Submarine Communications and fibre optics firm and US telecoms giant Sprint in 1990. In 1991, GPT agreed to participate in a feasibility study as a prospective supplier for the submarine cable network. GPT announced plans to have the new system up and running by 1992, and part of the network was to be laid beneath the Nottingham and Beeston Canal, linking central Nottingham with the rest of the country. 
Most underwater cables carried between 8 and 12 fibres, whereas the new cable could carry over 5 times as many and could be linked directly to the national telephone network. This project was explored as part of an 18-month project by British Waterways, who were investigating the telecommunications potential of their canals. The feasibility of the submarine cable network was eventually ruled out, but in 1992, British Waterways, GPT and Sprint expressed their desire to lay cables along the canal towpaths as part of a £500 million investment, in much the same way Mercury had the previous year. As things progressed, Sprint pulled out after forming an alliance with France Telecom and Deutsche Telekom. In November 1993, plans were put forward for a towpath-based fibre optic installation in Scotland. A trial cable was soon installed along the Forth and Clyde and Union Canals. The 55 miles of cable between Edinburgh and Glasgow was ready for use by April 1994. This project gave rise to Fiberway. Fiberway was launched on March 9, 1994, and its job was to create a telecommunications network alongside Britain's thousands of miles of canals. The four-year project saw special tunnelling devices called moles being used to burrow out the new conduits, dragging miles of cable behind them. More than 60% of the population lived or worked less than 10 miles from a canal, and Fiberway claimed that cable networks would be able to service 75% of the population within 10 years. They planned to lease the system to public network operators, providing telecommunications, internet services, multimedia and home shopping. Information on the rollout and route is extremely hard to come by nowadays, so I'll piece it together as best as possible. The planned 1,100km or 683-mile route began with a first phase consisting of the first 360km or 223 miles. This first phase was along the Grand Union Canal in Warwickshire, where work began on the Birmingham to London route in July 1994. Work started on the Basingstoke Canal and New Way Navigation in August 1994, the Trent and Mersey Canal and the Worcester and Birmingham Canal in April 1997, the Birmingham and Faisley Canal in June 1997, and the Birmingham and Warwick Junction Canal in August 1997. By Christmas of that year, 600 miles or 965 kilometres of fibre optic cable was laid along the canal towpaths, with the goal to create a complete figure of eight configuration linking the UK's major cities with Birmingham at the centre. The network continued to grow, and the Staffordshire and Worcester Canal in July 1998, and the Kennet and Avon Canal in January 1999 were incorporated into the network. The figure of eight covered London, Woking, Birmingham, Leeds, Sheffield, Warrington, Gloucester, Manchester, Bristol, Nottingham and any other major towns and cities along the way. The southern half of the loop was switched on in January 1998. I've overlaid the canals for which I found evidence of cables being laid on their towpaths on Google Earth. This is the only map that shows the figure of 8 route. It's clear that the Manchester to Leeds and Birmingham to Leeds sections didn't follow the canal routes, but most likely roads or other infrastructure. Other canals that appear to have been added, but ones I can't find concrete evidence for, are the River Severn Navigation and the Bridgewater Canal. I know Warrington Council was approached in 1992, so for the Warrington to Manchester run, this would make sense. This is the only official publicly available fiberway route map in existence and it's very low quality. Improving it slightly, we can see that it shows that perhaps some other small canal lengths around Birmingham may have been used, as well as other spurs of the Grand Union Canal around London and even possibly the River Thames. Again, this is all very muddy and unclear. The Rochdale Canal was excluded from Fiberway's plans in the mid-1990s, and I couldn't find any other evidence to suggest that it was later included. If anybody knows of the full list of canals, then please let us know in the comments. Television cable company TeleWest was the first to start using the network in 1998. By 1999, Fiberway's network of cables was 1,287 kilometres or 800 miles long, with 60% of the Fiberway network being installed on canal towpaths. Again, this indicates that the Leeds to Manchester and Leeds to Birmingham sections were along other infrastructure and not the canals. 
By 2000, Fiberway owned 3,700 miles of fibre optic cable that it was leasing to telecoms operators. It doubled British Waterways' income from £51 million to £100 million. The fibre cables were buried 60 centimetres under the path in reinforced plastic ducts. Each duct initially carried two cables capable of carrying 32,000 phone calls and 400 digital television programmes at the same time. The ducts were large enough to carry eight 48 strand fibre optic cables in all, with amplifiers installed every 100 kilometres to boost the signal. In 2000, Fiberway was renamed Ipsaris. In June 2001, EasyNet acquired Ipsaris from GEC, which was now Marconi Communications, in an all share deal worth £300 million. The deal resulted in Marconi owning a 72% stake in EasyNet. However, by March 2002, demand for space on the EasyNet network had slumped, and EasyNet effectively mothballed the Ipsaris fibre optic network. The value of the entire network was written down from £350 million to just £15 million, and 90 staff members were axed in an effort to reduce costs. On the 31st of December 2005, the Office of Fair Trading Regulator cleared the acquisition of EasyNet by British Sky Broadcasting. EasyNet was purchased and owned by British Sky Broadcasting from 2006 to 2010. In 2010, B-Sky B sold the EasyNet brands and customer base to Lloyds Development Capital or LDC, the private equity arm of Lloyds Banking Group. In 2013, LDC sold its stake in EasyNet to MDNX, backed by private equity firm Equistone Partners Europe, who took a majority stake in the newly formed group. This new group would continue to trade under the EasyNet brand. In October 2015, the EasyNet group of companies was acquired by Interroot for £402 million. Other operators have also installed fibre optic cables along the towpath since, and combined, they provide British waterways, now the Canal and River Trust and Scottish Canals, with a considerable income. The extent of the network today is unclear. The list of canals it's installed under isn't clear either, but according to the Canal and River Trust, the network is still in use. So, next time you're taking a stroll down your local, while there's water gently and very slowly flowing beside you in 200-year-old infrastructure, bear in mind that there may be phone calls, television and internet traffic flowing beneath your feet. Thank mm-hmm. you.